Good morning. Today is December 28th, 2014. Welcome to the Stepping Stones Project. So for today, we're going to be doing a quick review of all of Isaiah, Isaiah 1 to 66. I call this Isaiah in a nutshell. This week, we'll conclude our study of Isaiah. We've come, I think, a long way, and so I'd like to look back and uh, just cherry pick some of the quotations, um, and I'll try to remind you of the context of some of those and try to remind you of some of the pieces of the story. I hope that you've uh, followed along enough that these things are memory jogs for you just to remember. And then I'll attempt to put on some, uh, some takeaways from the entire book of Isaiah at the end. And I will confess, that was a tad challenging. So we'll go through. Uh, I'd like to, to comment that some of you may not recognize, um, you know, the, the, the entire Bible has 66 books in it. And it's by coincidence, I guess, that uh, Isaiah happens to have 66 chapters. And so some people refer to Isaiah as the mini Bible. The whole concepts that are found in our Bible, um, the idea of sin separating us from God, which relates back to Adam and Eve, and this time of separation and some of the things that have occurred there, and the whole idea of a coming uh, Messiah and the prophecies that come, and then we see that the servants of the Lord later in Isaiah coming, and then the idea, idea of a new heavens and a new earth. That pretty much is Genesis to Revelation in one book if you all follow that, that, that Isaiah has covered and touched on all of these major biblical themes and, and even covers some of the major concepts that are involved in other parts of the Bible. And so uh, while it's a very difficult book to read, at least I feel it is, Isaiah, to just re sit down and read it straight through, um, there are major themes here that I hope you have picked up on, and I'll try to highlight for you and remind you of a few of those. So let's go ahead, and I, I use this, uh, this imagery throughout the Isaiah overview and this is Isaiah, the first one, 1 through 39. And so let's do some pieces from there to start out with. I did throw in some of my imagery from there. So um, this is the map that was demonstrating what we referred to as the Assyrian threat. So this shows Assyria coming down into Israel, kind of a boom, there it is. Um, although I didn't draw on the screen here. But this is um, the, the, the first major empire of the world I explained to you. And this is Assyria. And so they came out of this area in the Fertile Crescent and came down around the area that's now modern-day Israel and all the way down into Egypt. And so what has been happening is in that we have our, our opening parts of, of Isaiah. We have our first king that we encounter. His name is Ahaz. And Ahaz is very concerned about what's going to be happening here. Um, he is uh, at war first with the northern kingdom of, uh, of, uh, that's there. He, he, the northern kingdom is split away from the southern kingdom uh, within Israel. And uh, he's concerned that what will happen if he doesn't make uh, alliances. And so he makes an appeasement to, to with Assyria. And as Assyria comes and spreads around them, I refer to this as an unholy alliance. And I'll kind of remind you of some of that. Let me go ahead and we're just going to jump into Isaiah 1, and I'm just going to read selected verses as we go along to try and jog your memory for what was happening. Isaiah has been writing as prophecy and explaining that the nation of Israel is not following as they should. So Isaiah 1, 3, he said that the ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And God's saying, these are supposed to be my people, but they're not following. And how is that? Well, continuing on in chapter 1, he says, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this trampling of my courts? Now, the people of Israel would say, well, we're doing exactly what you told us to do. And he'd say, oh, yeah, you're going through the motions, but where is your contrite heart? Where is your true repentance? Where is your inner change that is happening because of all of this? Because without that, you're just, well, trampling my courts. So as you think about coming to church and the act of doing that, are you coming to church just because it's something you're supposed to do? Or are you coming here this morning because you want to change and you want to be changed? I hope it's more the latter than the former. Continuing on in chapter 1, God speaks to this nation that is turned away from him. And this is the real problem. Ahaz sees the problem as the coming Assyrian armies. That's not the problem. The real problem is people are far from God. If they are near to God, the armies don't matter. And God has shown that time and time and time again. 
If you're near to me, nothing else really matters. All the rest of it grows strangely dim. So God is speaking to Israel in the same way he's speaking to you and to me today. And he says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And God, of course, is pleading with the nation of Israel and with us to turn from our mistakes, turn from our own way, and return to his. Going into chapter 2, we read about this idea. This is where Isaiah is writing about a, a coming Messiah. And this specifically refers to what we will call the 1,000-year reign of Christ or the millennial reign of Christ and how strong it will be that during those 1,000 years, the idea of even teaching war will be completely foreign. The peace will be so strong and so complete that there won't be a need to have a standing army because Christ is our army. And as he speaks through this, then he says in Isaiah 2, 4, he shall judge, he being, this is Jesus Christ here on earth, he shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Skipping over a bit to Isaiah chapter 6, this is the call of Isaiah. Isaiah speaking now, he's writing personally about what happened that caused him to be writing this book. Find it interesting, he's already written five chapters of prophecy, but he chooses chapter 6 to say, kind of, by the way, this is why I'm doing this. You know, sort of that was all for a nice introduction, but let me tell you how this all started. And so he explains that before the King Ahaz was there, there was King Uzziah. And so this is what he explains. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So he's responding to this that, you know, the re- God is being revealed, at least in smoke, and his majesty is there. He understands that he is in the presence of God. And he, his reaction at being confronted with the holiness of God is, I'm toast. I, 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 I'm not clean and I am in a holy place. And so he is waiting, I believe, to be fried to a crisp. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. And this is Isaiah answering his call to be a prophet and to speak the rest of the chapters that we will hear. In verse 7, we have the story of Ahaz and the people, the armies that are around Ahaz. And Isaiah is speaking to him, trying to explain, if you would only trust in God, that God will provide, and Ahaz is like, I'm really busy defending the city right now. If you don't mind, would you please let me take care of what's important? And Isaiah is saying, God will take care of you if you want, ask for a sign. This is verse chapter 7, starting of the, the 9b. Isaiah says to him, if you are not firm in faith, you are not firm at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol, 
are as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. <clears throat> and he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Continuing this prophecy over in chapter 9, Isaiah writes further, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now I've presented to you the idea of what I, what's been called double fulfillment. In double fulfillment, the prophet sees things that will occur both at a time of uh, his present occurrence or near present occurrence, and also at some future, far future and later date. And this is what I believe has happened here. I think that there was a, an actual woman who at the time of the prophecy was a virgin. She would later not be a virgin, would later conceive, and there would be a son. And there are other things I've skipped between chapter seven and nine that are specific prophecies, but with time these things happen, all of this threat will have passed beyond you. But there is a second fulfillment in the actual virgin birth by Mary of Jesus of Nazareth. And so that's where we have this dual fulfillment that occurs once in that during the actual day and a second time there. You, you can argue this a couple different ways. But I think that that's a good interpretation here. So continuing on in chapter 9, still continuing talking about Jesus, Isaiah writes, Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's skip over to chapter 11, where he's speaking about what tribe that this particular person will come from. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. I reminded you that Jesse is, of course, the father of David. And so this is to be of the line of David uh, within that tribe. When there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equality with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked so we're going to skip forward a bit now in the book of isaiah and talk about another king this other king was king hezekiah if ahaz made the unholy alliance for fear of the assyrians hezekiah has responded in a way that's more appropriate he comes and sees that there are these inroads that the Assyrians have made into Israelite culture. There are altars and idols that are common now throughout the land during these years. And he says, this is not right. This is not what we should do. And he begins a program to eliminate the false Assyrian gods and altars from the lands that are there. In response to that, the Assyrians see him as being one that's supposed to be a vassal, a servant of them. And in fact, they see that he seems to be considering an uprising. And so they send him a series of letters basically informing him that if he doesn't come in line quickly, they will come and destroy everything that is there of the city of Jerusalem and all of the people. And they actually march and, and they conquer several other cities and besiege Jerusalem itself. And so King Hezekiah is there and he receives these letters. The picture I have up is one I used from the children's sermon, which says, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And the question is, what does Hezekiah do with this threat? And the answer is, he goes straight to the temple. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He physically kneels before the altar, and he physically lays out the letters and says, God, this is your problem. This is for you to decide. Your hand is the one that will save us. 
your hand is the one that is strong enough to protect us. I'll jump to the conclusion of that part of the story. And the answer is, and the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home to live at Nineveh. <clears throat> he pushed back from the table and said, maybe we'll just leave Jerusalem just the way it is. Now, that's where Hezekiah did right. Unfortunately, he also makes a mistake. So after that time, he had a time when he was very ill. And he thought he was going to die. In fact, God said he was going to die, and he prayed, and God said, well, I'll give you some additional time. Sherry and I were talking. It's interesting the number of you know, times that people beg for something for extra time or extra life or something, and then when it's given to them, it seems almost like it would have been better if they hadn't received it. Okay? This is one of those times. So this is Hezekiah's mistake. Starting at 39, verse 1. At that time... Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, the king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly, and he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his whole armory, and all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all of his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. This is the messengers from Babylon, by the way. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? Hezekiah goes on to explain, Oh, they're from this really cool new nation called Babylon. They're against the Assyrians. And he says, And what did you show them? Oh, I showed them everything. And Isaiah buries his face in his hands and says, There will come a day when there is nothing left that the Babylonians have not carried off. And Hezekiah says, well, that's okay. It'll be after I'm no longer king. It's a great answer. All right. So this is Hezekiah's mistake in 39. That kind of concludes our quick overview of the first section of Isaiah. Let's jump into the second one. I said this time for a change. This map ironically looks kind of like the other map. It's the same basic shape of a, a coming up out of the Fertile Crescent and going all the way over Nineveh and then down to the same general area. This is this is the Babylonian Empire, which took over the Assyrian Empire, which was, of course, supposed to be unconquerable. You know how that goes, right? Just like the Titanic was unsinkable. Yeah, right. Okay. So the Babylonians took over the, that, and they become, of course, the new threat. The Babylonians come in. They are not going to mess around. Okay? So as soon as we cross the new area, this set of prophecies, which interestingly enough are written in 700 BC, and the Babylonian threat, they will come in and 200 years later. But still, Isaiah is writing to those people for what they will be reading 200 years after the fact um, and what God says to them. And God, God has his people. He's allowed his people to go into a time of punishment because of their mistakes. And yet he still cares for them while they're there. He starts out in verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended and her iniquity is pardoned that his shearers receive from the Lord's hand double for her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall be made level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So this is the coming promise to those exiles in Babylon that there is a hope, there is a plan, and there is redemption that is coming, even for them who are underneath punishment. As he continues comforting them, we find verses that you might recognize, like over in 4029. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. As we cross into 42, 
we start encountering this future set of prophecies about a Messiah who is coming. It's variously called the servant of the Lord or related ideas. And so we have some in 42, and this will cross over to about 55. Starting at 42.1, Behold my servant whom I am uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will bring forth, faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Jumping to 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And this is a theme that I mentioned many, many times throughout these verses, that there is only one God. This idea that says, it's fascinating to look if you kind of pick this apart. Thus says the Lord. Okay, who's that? That's probably God the Father. The King of Israel. Okay, that's probably the Father. And his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. That sounds like the Son. So the Lord, the King of Israel, that's, I think, one. And that's clearly plural. His Redeemer, Lord of hosts. So two of them together say, I am the first, I am the last. That's a reference to Jesus and over, and over in uh, Revelation. This certainly appears to be. I am the first, I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And this gets into some of the complexities we talked about with the Trinity, that you have this multiple yet singularity. You have multiple ideas. There's, there's plurals, yet they're singular. And how is that resolved? Well, not easily is the short answer, but nevertheless, how do we do, draw that? Yeah, well, this is where I threw up the diagram I have here, which is that the biblical model is one God in three persons. And I mentioned here, for example, that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. That's the outside circle. But there are statements on the inside that are also true, that the Son is God, the Father is God, and the Spirit is God. So this is the profession, as I understand it, from biblical model, and I feel pretty confident on this, that it's one God in three persons. There is clear separation. If you speak to God the Father, you speak to God the Son, you're going to get different perceptions and you will see different persons. Yet we say in computer programming that certain words are reserved words, meaning you're not allowed to define them yourself. You can't make them your own variable. The word God is a reserved word in the Bible. God has chosen to define God, and he has defined it this way. So this is the, one of those things where uh, do I find it confusing? Absolutely. Do I believe it's, this, this is what the Bible says? Absolutely. So there you go. One God and three persons. Isaiah 45. This is where we see the next major king come on the, the throne. So before we had Hezekiah. I'm sorry, first we had Ahaz, then Hezekiah. Now we're going to go to Cyrus. Now Cyrus is fascinating because God has chosen Cyrus as his anointed. God has chosen to use Cyrus. But God is very, very clear that he does not know Cyrus in the sense that, well, maybe it's better to say Cyrus does not know him, that he is not a Jew, he is not a follower of God, yet God is going to use him. So uh, Isaiah 45, starting at verse 1, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belt of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. And then he'll go on to explain how he's going to use Cyrus. And again, interesting because, you know, Isaiah wrote this 200 years approximately before Cyrus would come to power, uh, maybe 150 years before Cyrus was even born. This was Cyrus the Great, and his empire will extend far beyond what we've seen for the, the traditional uh, Babylonian Empire, we'll have what's called the, uh, the, the Persian Empire, and this will continue into not only Egypt and not only into Turkey, but it would touch all the way to the Indus River over in India, it would extend all the way through modern day, not only Iraq, but also Iran, uh, and it would, would cover through it just a huge, huge geography, and hence the term the Great, Cyrus the Great. 
Continuing back with Isaiah 52, we'll return to the servant of the Lord. Now, therefore, what, I, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? Their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. I'll throw up the map that shows some of the topography here with Israel over on the west, on the left, and then, of course, the Sea of Galilee and Jordan River separating that out, and the Golan Heights over on the right, and then Syria, and beyond that, of course, would be Babylon. And my comment was that if one's coming from Jerusalem to speak to the refugees who are in exile in Babylon, they have to cross over the mountains. And so how beautiful are the feet upon the mountains of those who bring the good news of the salvation. This goes with, of course, the idea that you make the way for, uh, for the Lord and uh, make straight his paths. Continuing with the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53.5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. This is by the wound and the blood of Jesus, of course, that takes our sin. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We'll pass now to our last section for Isaiah and kind of conclude with this, Isaiah 55, starting at verse 6. The Lord tells us, seek the Lord while he may be found. I'll repeat that. Seek the Lord while he may be found, which implies there is a time when he cannot be found. Okay, well, it's when he is near to you, and I would submit that if you're listening to my voice today, He's near to you. So seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God that he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I take great solace in this passage when there are parts of the Bible that I don't understand. When I try to explain to God, that doesn't make sense. Clearly, it doesn't add up the way you say. And then I remember that God says, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I go, oh, right, you're God, and I'm not. <clears throat> Isaiah 55. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish what I propose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word does not return void. Isaiah 59, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sin has hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. This is an important biblical concept that if you feel far away from God, who moved? Well, you did. Okay. And so, you know, God is everywhere. If you feel far apart from God, it's certainly one of the things that you need to repent of the things in your life, and that will help to restore part of the process. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. No one enters suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies. They conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. That's a bad set. As we talk about God and the pieces that are here, this implies that if you recognize that you have sinned, the only way that you know you have sinned is because there is part of God in you or around you. Think about it for a second. C.S. Lewis says that a fish would never have a concept that it was wet. 
it's all that it knows. Only us, when we jump into the water, do we say we are wet because it's not what we are used to. In our lives, if there is sin in our lives and we see that it is sin, it is only because there is another standard. We only recognize that it is darkness because we have sensed that there is light. In that area, it is God saying that there is light that we can come into and that our sins, which are as scarlet, can be as white as snow. And that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. But as we try to then become like him and do things like him, there are various spiritual practices we talked about. One of those included fasting and tithing. Verse 4, he says, Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice heard on high. Which, by the way, means that there is a way to fast, to be able to do it. And the related verses further had to do with tithing. It all has to do with sacrifice to bring spiritual focus. These are things that we give up, whether it's money or time or TV or food whatever it is that we are moving away from to provide spiritual clarity and spiritual focus. If you do that in such a way that you're trying to glorify yourself so you can say, look at me, look at what I have given up so that you can then be really you know, important spiritually. Well, then he says, that's not kind of fasting isn't going to bring you close to me. You do so in quiet. You do so in a way that is uh, between you and God. And that's what the important part is here. So behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your choice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke? to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Let's go over to Isaiah 61 and think about with Jesus. And this is the exact verses that he will quote later. I think it's in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. As Jesus read those, of course, as he began his ministry, his statement was that this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. And that is the beginning, of course, of his claiming upon the path that he is going to walk on, that he is the Messiah. As we talk, look to the future and what happens after Jesus' first coming, we see his second coming, and then eventually then all things made new. Speaking of that, in 65:17, Isaiah wrote, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. As we talk about that time and how close we will be with God, he explains it this way. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the fox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And finally, Isaiah 66. He talks about a time when his word will go forth to all the nations, and a a harvest from the nations shall come back to God as an offering. We read part of it this morning, but I'll finish with this, Isaiah 66, 20. And they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots and in litters and on mules and on dromedaries to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. And some of them, that's some of the people from all the nations, and some of them I will take for priests and Levites, says the Lord. 
I read that to you because it's important for you to understand that there are some of us and some of you who will be taken to be in service to the Lord, whether it's as missionaries or whether it's to serve in various capacities in the church, or perhaps even in some cases for some of you to go to seminary and go and do other things, perhaps even to be pastors on your own. And some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. Now he's talking now about the future. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make or shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. Here ends the reading of Isaiah. I've got a couple of takeaways for you. I think I've got five. Number one. God does not tolerate false worship. If you recall his comments about the trampling of his courts, this empty ritualistic going to church, God doesn't play that game. I think you need to understand that because it's something that we can get into very easily. God does not tolerate false worship. When you decide to come to church, you need to think about why it is you're showing up. And I think it's important to come with an open heart and an open mind to try and learn something every week. If you do that, I think God will honor that particular request. So number one, God does not tolerate false worship. Number two, God always had a plan for our salvation. God always had a plan for our salvation. I don't want you to have an image of God that God had the Garden of Eden and then he was shocked and surprised and completely amazed that suddenly sin entered in. God knew that was going to happen. You have to ask, well, if God gave us free choice and God knew that that free choice would result in sin, well, then why did he give us free choice? Well, this is an interesting conversation. I think the only way I can answer it is God seemed to think that the risks outweighed, I'm sorry, that the benefit outweighed the risks. That there was something good that would come of us worshiping him from a perspective of love and free will, rather than being little robots that we have to worship him and we can do no wrong. It's important to understand that even before the foundations of the earth, God understood there would be a need for a savior. And at the earliest musings that we have inside of Genesis, even Genesis chapter three, you can look back and see that, you know, you'll, you'll see the, the contest between the serpent and the one who will come. The, 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 that's called the proto-evangelium. It's the first gospel, if you will. And you'll see that the, <clears throat> that the serpent will strike him on the heel and he will crush the serpent's head. And as we continue getting further and further into Abraham and further into Genesis, we see then the repeating pieces. As you continue to read the Old Testament, you hear the musings and the ideas of a Messiah that's coming, the yearning for a Messiah. When we get to Isaiah, it's very specific. We've moved through a lot of time here, and God is very specific about what's going to happen. He will come from the, the stump of Jesse, from David. We've learned later, of course, that it will come from O Bethlehem. The, you know, you're the least, and, and all these different pieces that are here. There are very large numbers of prophecies about this coming Messiah that make it very specific of how it would occur. Number two is that God always had a plan for our salvation. It wasn't like this is some Hail Mary thing at the last second and said, oh, well, let's try and do it this way. Number three, if we refuse to listen to God, he will allow us to go through a time of punishment to get our attention. Number three, if we refuse to listen to God, if you stamp your foot, put your hand on your hip, look at God and say, no. Well, stand by. Okay? I've actually done that. I don't recommend it. If we refuse to listen to God, he will allow us to go through a time of punishment to get our attention. In this case, the Israelites were told, you're far from me, you're not listening, you're not listening, you're not listening. And they said, we need to save what's most important. We need to save our wealth. 
We need to save our geopolitical entity called the nation of Israel. And he said, that's not the nation of Israel. Those are bound, and that's not it. You are the nation of Israel. Following me makes you the nation of Israel. That's what's most important. And they said, we're really busy. We need to go prepare for war. You don't need to prepare for war. You need to prepare for me. I will take care of the war if you will do it, as you saw the difference between Ahaz and Hezekiah. Well, that didn't work, and in fact, the people end up then going off into Babylon, and they go into a time of exile. And that exile was difficult and painful, but at the same time, it also helped open their eyes and open their, soften their hearts so they're willing to enable to follow God. It gets into number four. Even in that time of punishment, he still has a plan for us if we will just let him lead. Again, even in that time of punishment, he still has a plan for us if we will just let him lead. Even in Babylon, even in exile, God was there. And as I said before, go back and read Daniel. Go back and read. He was moving in his people even in exile. And he was writing love letters to them through Isaiah 200 years before they went into exile. He knew how this was going to happen. And even when it's there, he said, comfort, comfort my people. He did not take delight in their punishment, even though he was in his wrath. I hope you understand the difference there between God saying, I am a just God. I will see that justice is done. And at the same time, of being a loving God and saying, oh, my people, why did you push me this far? I'm reminded by the billboard, don't make me come down there, God. <clears throat> Number five, my last one, all things will be made new. All things will be made new. Jesus will come again, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We see this in other places in the Bible. We see it in Daniel, interestingly enough. We also see it in Revelation. There's also some other pieces and hints that are out there in Thessalonians. But this is interesting that Isaiah speaks of this multiple times. There will be a new heavens and a new earth, and he gives us some ideas of what it will be like, that the lion and the lamb will lie down together, and a little child will lead them. All things will be made new, and Jesus will come again, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And that brings us to our question of the week, which is, what did God want me to learn from Isaiah? What did God want me to learn from Isaiah. We just invested four months of our lives, week after week, peeling across the, this particular book that was written something in the ballpark of 2,700 years ago. I think there was a reason that you sat through this. I think there was a reason you were here. It might be something I said, might be something I was supposed to say. Maybe your own study of Isaiah will help reveal something that was there. But I'm convinced that you were here for a reason. And I hope that you found what you were looking for, or perhaps more appropriately, you found that God was hoping you would look for. And I hope that there was a takeaway even beyond my simple takeaways, one that has in some small way changed you and given you appreciation for this book that we call the Mini Bible. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the book of Isaiah and the lessons that it has for us. And God, I barely scratched the surface. I know it. At the same time, I hope that people who have listened to this have had an opportunity to learn just a little bit. And perhaps through this study have come one step closer to you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.